Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A Dominion podcast. Uh, hi, welcome to Making Luck, a Dominion podcast. My name is Adam, and here with me is Jake. Hi, Jake. Hey, Adam. How you doing? I'm I'm okay. I just yeah. had some dinner, had some fish. Yeah. Uh, I think it was pretty tasty. Nice. It, it looked tasty. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. I'd, I didn't share any. I had Wendy's on the way here, so yeah. It's fine. Yeah. So everything everything's cool. Yeah. Um, before we get to the bread, uh, there was one uh, mini announcement I wanted to make. I don't know how many of you guys like sit and press the refresh button at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern on Tuesday nights for our podcast. Next week's podcast might be published Wednesday morning Eastern time. Life is happening. I may not get to it, and I may have to do the whole overnight upload. So, uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Just if it's if it's a few hours late. You want to look at it as a bonus upload. Yeah, it's a bonus <laughs> upload. It is it is a bonus upload yeah, time. Yeah, because it might not even happen at all. No, it's going to happen. <laughs> Well, I mean, the episode will happen. Yeah. It just might not be right at that time in the evening in case yeah. that matters to you. So I wanted to get that out of the way. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, wasn't there some, like, BS raffle that you wanted to do? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, but there was a raffle. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so last time on Making Luck, a Dominion podcast, uh, we went into how I have been ready to part with my immortality for a long time, oh, yeah. and so I was going to raffle that off to somebody. I have a little bit of a confession to make, and first off, we're going to get into a concept called the gambler's ruin. So uh, maybe <laughs> you've heard of this, and it's the idea that on an infinite timeline, any gambler with finite wealth is eventually going to go bankrupt no matter how unlucky he is, because gambling is no matter how lucky he is, because gambling is a sequence of numbers, and eventually, on an infinite timeline, a sequence of numbers will occur that will bankrupt the gambler, no matter what the game is. And so, the same thing kind of works with immortal people and your psyche. Eventually, a sequence of numbers will occur that will bankrupt you mentally, because the world's mind is infinite and yours is not, so that's why I need to have somebody willingly take the immortality from me, oh. and that's why I can't actually select... A winner for this raffle. Oh, they have to select themselves. You have to willingly take it. So the winner of this raffle isn't somebody I even need to choose necessarily. You need only ask. However, that's not true for this next raffle, which is a $15 <laughs> Chipotle gift card. <laughs> Yum, Chipotle. Ooh, wow, really? Mm, yeah. <laughs> wow, all right, I'm entering this business. I love yeah, Chipotle. Yeah, so. It's um, delicious. Good uh, luck two, to everyone. Two comments. So, like, I was driving for about five hours to go visit some friends this weekend. And, um, you know, I was doing some podcasts, uh, other podcasts, because obviously we're only one hour a week. But... Uh, but I was I was doing that, and in between, you know, listening to the radio, and, and for a while, you know, sometimes you just want some quiet. And during the quiet, I started thinking about my own mortality. Yeah. And, like, I was, like, I was starting to feel a little funny, like a little scared, like the chill down your spine kind of thing. Yeah, we'll uh, get there. Yeah, and then... Not me, but... So it was a little distressing. Um, but then I, I stopped for gas and get something to eat, and I took a number two, and I felt a lot better. So yeah, uh, I wanted to share that with you guys, just in case that that helps you in the context. And also, I just put on some of this um, Japanese cherry blossom blossom hand lotion from it Bath and delicious. Body Works. I think it smells terrible. I hate it. I well, yeah. I mean, it's it also might have no, to it's do. It actually with, smells delicious. I think it might, it might have something to do with the fact that as I was cooking that fish dinner. I think I, like, burned some of my arm <laughs> hair, so it's kind of combined with the scent of burning hair. Yeah, so, so like, Japanese cherry blossoms and burning flesh. It's just like the weekend. Well, um, I mean, this hand lotion doesn't really smell like Japanese cherry blossoms, because I love the way those flesh. smells. Yeah. Or bur but if you want, like, a smell to this le week's episode, if you want to try and fully immerse yourself, yeah, well, it's burning hair, not burning flesh. Well, hair is flesh. Write in the comment section <laughs> if you think hair is flesh. We'd really it like is. to hear from you. Uh, speaking of writing in the comment it's section. It's keratin produced by your body. Sure. Uh, <laughs> let us know what you think. So, uh, speaking of the comment section, yeah. uh, we had some feedback from the last episode. Um, yeah. Wandering Winder posted some things about the kingdom. And uh, I had the privilege of playing many... <laughs> many games of that kingdom with him. There is a five-hour YouTube video yeah. of Adam and Wandering Winder just playing that kingdom, and oh my god, do they tear it apart. Yeah, when he said, we will tear this kingdom apart, I thought he might have been speaking figurati figuratively or like maybe exaggerating it a bit, but no, well, like we beat the crap out of it. Yeah. 
pretty much everything was tried, and I just want to point out that the strategy that I was uh, promoting was uh, determined to be best. Yeah, and so I only got to play the Kingdom a few times. I, I watched some of Adam's games with Wandering Winter, and we played a couple of games tonight before we got started, and you know, I've had a little bit of time to play with the board. And basically, there were kind of two decks that were talked about, and one of them, and they were kind of the same deck, it's just whether or not you went for Apothecary. Uh, I have an idea. Okay. Let's read the Kingdom. Maybe. Maybe? Oh, yeah. I guess that we should do that, right? <laughs> Maybe. Like, yeah, I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't forget that. I was just going to not do it this time. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. we try and mix things up on Making Luck, a Dominion <laughs> podcast. And, yeah. and, you know, it's really based on feedback from you guys. So, like, if, yeah. if you like something or you don't like something, like tell, maybe the smell of this episode. Tell us Jake is an idiot, and uh, we'll keep going and tell him to read the kingdom this time. I'm not going to disagree, but, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, the cards in this kingdom uh, were really, really interesting, and I'm going to yeah. read them now. Are you? Uh, yeah, so uh, we had Apothecary, we had Royal Blacksmith, Amulet, Oasis, Herald, Sea Hag, Spice Merchant, Apprentice, Contraband, and Vampire, and Vampire turns into Bat. Uh, once more for our audio-only listeners, we had Royal Blacksmith, Apothecary, Amulet, Oasis, Herald, Sea Hag, Spice Merchant, Apprentice, Contraband, and Vampire. Vampire again turns into Bat. So thematic. Yeah. Yeah, so like there were there were a lot of points of contention that Wandering Winder originally had with the kingdom. Like, do you bother with this spice merchant for the plus buy? Do you bother with apothecary if you even if you're gonna not trash your coppers? <clears throat> Turns out I was like, hey, let's let's get apothecary, let's trash the coppers, and let's go for spice merchant with the plus buy. Yeah, so and I then, actually thought that neither deck was gonna be able to build to double province faster than a single province deck could just win the game. Yeah. I was wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, Sea Hag is pretty important for, for shutting down decks that aim to not build enough uh, yeah. to use, like, Royal Blacksmith for draw and Herald with Apothecary for that village effect. Like, if you don't jump through those hoops, you can have Sea Hag played on you, and that will have an effect on you, even if you have lots of amulets. Yeah, so you don't open Sea Hag. By any means, that's, because that's not good. the buying of the Sea Hag in this case is a tactical play after you've read that your opponent is vulnerable to it. It's one of those times where you play differently because Sea Hag is out, oh, yeah. but it's not necessarily something that factors into what you want to be doing because if you it buy sucks. It's yeah, a bad card. You don't want it, it, to. I mean, buying it implies your opponent made a mistake and you're punishing that mistake. In this particular case, yeah, like I don't want to open with it though because I want to open with a potion. Right, yeah. Potion. And, and, like, Sea Hag is not Potion. Yeah, so, and eventually you do trash all your coppers here, but the Apothecary is still super good because of Herald. Yeah, you you really want that village effect out of Herald, yeah. and you just can't have that reliably unless you have Apothecaries in your deck. And the village effect is very, very important because you have this payload of the amulets gaining silvers and then you draw the silvers that turn and then you play them with spice merchant to get two coins and a buy and obviously you're going to be drawing with royal blacksmith all of that if you've noticed is terminal so yes you need the villages <laughs> you, need, you need to do that um yeah and the vampire is probably something you pick up sooner rather than later to get yeah, like, heralds vampire doesn't really gel with this deck but it's such a powerful card that like you put it in the deck anyway because first of all um the bat is pretty useful should your opponent make the mistake of going for sea hag. Yeah. Uh, but also, like, you can gain heralds with it, you can gain a spicy, uh, you can gain duchies with it in the end game, which is important, and, you know, attacking your opponent is pretty important as well. So, like, uh, it's vampire and you get it, and it's good. Yeah. Uh, the only parts of the kingdom I don't think I saw play ever were... Obviously contraband, because I almost it's, never see contraband yeah, it's, play. Yeah, it's a bad card. Th there are times when I'll buy it, but it's, it's rare. Yeah. Uh, and Apprentice. Apprentice is just not 
necessary here? Well, as part of what we thought was the best strategy, you certainly don't want Apprentice in it. However, there are other strategies that were tested, and uh, Apprentice is pretty decent in those strategies, uh, especially a, a strategy that tries to get out to an early lead and wants the staying power. Apprentice can certainly have okay. a role in those decks. The thing is, uh, those decks were determined to just not be as good as the one we built and talked about. So yeah. um, if, in theory, both players are going for that deck, then yeah, no one's going to get an Apprentice. Yeah, right. Uh, I think if you're going for this deck we're talking about, at some point, uh, your opponent playing a Sea Hag on you is actually beneficial. Yeah, it's bat food. Yeah, like you, you're trashing silvers to bat in some cases because gains are really tight. Like Vampire doesn't really net gain you cards over the long term. No. Spice Merchant doesn't do that either. The only way to do it is Amulet. So like gains are pretty, they're a precious material and just gaining them a curse as bat food. It, it can be potentially quite good. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so yeah, if if you want to watch some games of this kingdom, <laughs> boy, does we, Adam have you covered? We got him, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually, you know what, uh, Jonas Kilker or yeah. Jonas Kilker, don't know how you say it, but uh, I believe that that gentleman, I'm assuming, watched the entire video. Nice. So, um, I didn't even do that. Yeah, like I didn't. <laughs> I didn't do it. I played through the game, so like I'm not spending five more hours going through all that again. Like I was there the first time. It's okay. Yeah. There's a lot of games, and like I think it's I think it's educational about not only apothecary but also sea hag, and uh, you know a couple of the other things around here, just like um, vampire. Even like you, there's there's some really good stuff in there, and I I think it's uh, I think it's a cool kingdom. I enjoy playing. Yeah. It was cool. I really liked the games that I got to play with it, yeah. Yeah. And nothing stopping you from playing more games with that kingdom. Nothing at all. Yep. I can reload it when I get home, play That's it right. against Lord Raddington. Yeah. Or, if Adam's not sick of it yet, maybe Adam and I can get a few games of it in. By the way, <laughs> uh, if you play Lord Raddington, you're going to need that Sea Hag. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. You're actually going to have a tough time winning if you don't get Sea Hag. That's true. Yeah. I lost to Lord Raddington. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> oh, yeah. When I was first doing this board, I That's lost amazing. to Lord Raddington because I'm like, Sea Hag's a bad card, and I didn't realize he was just playing big money with, yeah. like, whatever. And, uh, yeah, you, you do need Sea Hag to slow that and down. if you do get the Sea Hag in that case, you just destroy it. Oh, it's, it's pretty pathetic. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, a lot of times when I go to Jungle Gems to the deli, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm getting some things for my sandwiches for the week. You know, I don't get all lunch meat, and I don't get all cheese, right? You get no. some of each. You, yeah, you've you, got to split what you're getting. you got to split it in half, just like when you're, like, cutting... Cutting a sandwich in half? Cutting a sandwich in half. When you're splitting that sandwich you in half? You split it with yeah. a person who you're not splitting. Uh, most of the time you're not splitting that person. Yeah, that person is staying in one piece. Uh, by the way, so our topic for today's episode is going to be identifying important splits on the kingdom and how you oh. play around them. Oh, the... I thought we were like doing the splits like where you get down, like the dance move, you get down and your legs are... I've been practicing all week, man. I mean, and no one can take that from you. Um, that time that you spent doing that, but today... If you're looking on the video, it. like, I'm gonna do it right now on the webcam. Yeah. See? Wow. That's amazing. His shirt's not even off. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be later this episode. Yeah, so, uh, the important thing, of course, is to talk about, before we get into the significance of this to Dominion, and how you use it to win games, what is a split? Yeah, so like uh, that that word has several meanings. Sure. That even apply to Dominion because there's like split piles. Yeah. Where there's five of each card, and and that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> no, we're talking about a pile. Well, although it factors into what we're talking about. Sure. In some ways, we're talking about a pile that is almost like predetermined to run out at the beginning. It, like it's going to run out throughout the game. That, that does run out. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we're talking about how many of that card each player gets and yeah. how that's utilized to gain an advantage. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and I think uh, I think there's a, a distinction to make here. Like, sometimes you say the curse split or the ruin split where you don't want the card. 
Yeah. And sometimes you're talking about, oh, the province split or the duchy split. And, you know, these are about... You, these are, I kind of lump these together because they're mostly related to points, although ruins, maybe not. But, like, I mean, the, the way that those splits matter is quite different. It's I mean, talking about that would be very different than talking about, like, action cards. Right. Something like that. And so uh, I think that... I mean, it's the same word, but... The, the things that we wanted to talk about for this episode are yeah. related to those action cards. Yeah, Yeah. so we're going to give sort of a prescriptive definition of splits, and it just so you guys know, it only applies to our conversation in this episode. Um, you don't have to necessarily agree everything that we're calling a split or not a split, but just understand that what we're talking about here is uh, the definition we're going to give, and it's important as much as talking about what is a split, what isn't a split, yeah, like and we, how we're talking about it. We don't want to scope creep this, because sure. you know, we don't want this episode to take two hours like the Nocturne episode and did. And also to just be about all of Dominion. Right. Uh, yeah. We could go off on a lot of tangents, and we're going to try to minimize that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, so like, what isn't a split? So we're talking about piles that are running out, but we're not just talking about piles that happen to run out. We're talking about the piles that run out, and it was important, basically. We're talking about the piles that run out, and whoever got more of them, and how much of that, gives one player a pretty significant advantage in some way of winning the game. Yeah, so that, that I would say that's an important split in the game. Yeah. Like, I'm happy that I got six of these, or I'm sad yeah. that I got three. Like, that's an important split. Yeah, and, and like, something could become a split based on how, it, the way we're talking about it, based on how much you win or lose it by, too. For sure. Right. Like, yeah. something may not have been a split unless you get eight of them. And all of a sudden, <laughs> your opponent doesn't have what they need to do what they want to do. And then that then that became a split because you won it by so much. Yeah, so, like, that's a situation where it's like, this pile's going to run out, and so I need to make sure I get enough of it, or I get as much of it as possible. Right. And so, like, there's, there's a situation where perhaps you've determined that the best card for your deck is A, but you're worried about card B because of the split of card B. Yeah. And so you're now going to consider getting card B instead because of the split. Yeah. And so like I, when I say prioritizing the, the B split, that's kind of what I'm talking about in yeah. this episode. And we're not even necessarily talking about card power level either. Because like another non-example would be like Magpies or something. A very powerful card, right? Mm -hmm. But like you don't usually talk about the Magpie split because... Getting seven magpies versus getting three of them doesn't make a huge difference. I mean, a lot of times it doesn't, and like a lot of times you're not going to be like, well, I guess I need to buy a magpie because they're gone. No, you're just kind of, kind of hope that magpie hits something that gives you another one, yeah. and then be sad when it doesn't. Anyway, that's yeah. a little bit of a sore spot for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but but you yeah. can see a little tear rolling down his cheek. I mean, I okay, I put eye drops in, so that's. I mean, it is a tear, but... That's what he usually says, yeah. <sighs> Whatever. <laughs> Fine. You can have this one. Whatever. So, like, how do you recognize that a split is going to be important, and how do you know that you should be prioritizing it, and when? So, like, yeah. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah, so th I want to go into one general Dominion tip, and there are going to be a few caveats to this, but I think that this is a good piece of advice that will apply to splits especially. In Dominion... You don't want to rely on your opponent making a mistake. If your strategy involves your opponent making a mistake, you're probably not making the best decisions yourself. <laughs> so um, to that end, if you decide that a strategy is best, you probably want to assume that your opponent is going to be going for it as you do. So like that them not doing that would be them making a mistake. So like if something is important to your strategy, you want to assume they're going to contest it. Okay. I and I like the spirit. I like your spirit. Uh, I like the spirit of what Thank you're you. saying. Um, I like my spirit too. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you're raffling it away. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but uh, but I want to caveat the crap out of it. So first of all, <coughs> what he's not saying is um, I'm gonna. Go, I've decided on my strategy, but then I see my opponent doing something else, and I just assume, oh wow, that must be better. I must have missed something. I guess I'm gonna go for that now. Like no. Believe in yourself. <laughs> Stick like, to your guns. Well, I mean, if you think that's better, then then do it. Like, in the worst case, you find out that the other thing was better. Now, if you're certain of it, maybe pivot into it. But, like, 
don't just go play what your opponent's doing because they're doing it. That's not that's not what we're saying. Yeah. Also, um, we're more talking about when you start the game off, you might like position yourself to get more of a card just because you need to understand that you're not always going to have the option of doing it. Sure, and that's why opening with gainers is good, right? Yeah, right. To, to set yourself up for that. Uh, another thing that I want to caveat is the fact that this advice is pretty specific to two-player games. And I know pretty much everything we say on the podcast is, is viewed through that lens unless we state it otherwise, but um, it's just exceptionally different in this particular case. Sure. Because in a three-player game, you can't go about it with that level of... Uh, with that train of thought. Like That's just going to get you in big trouble and, and potentially do very bad things to you. Um, yeah. And so, like, I, I, I guess I just want to talk about this for maybe 60 seconds. So, like... When I'm thinking about my strategy in a two-player game, I look at the board and I think about all the things I can do, assuming that I'm not going to be contested. Because that's the relevant metric. If my opponent decides to contest me, it doesn't matter how good what I'm doing is versus big money anymore. Yeah. Because neither person is playing big money. And big money wouldn't have contested these uh, these villages. So yeah. I don't have to worry about whether big money could beat me. In a three-player game... One guy can contest me, making this thing suck because I only have five villages, and then the third guy could just be playing big money, and big money can win. And then you can get really salty because you think you're doing something better, and you lost a big money, and what happened? Well, you're playing a three-player game. Yeah. It's different. That's that's a very fair point, and like, I don't have a whole lot of experience with three-player games myself, but it holds up with all the ones I have played. Right. So... Uh, I mean, I, I might poke at it when a certain piece of advice is especially, like, garbo for three-player games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this one in particular, like, do not think this way in a three-player game. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of the discussion about splits is yeah. going to be invalid for a three-player game. Um, yeah, I think so. And, and it's just going to play completely differently. Like, the village split can matter, but, like, there are so many people contesting you on it that you're probably not going to be getting enough to really do anything and you also might go for them way earlier. As a result, like it, it gets real different, real weird, and we're not talking about it. By the way, if you uh, play three-player games and you enjoy them, um, we're glad you're having fun. And so, um, <laughs> and I'm gonna have a tournament in the end yeah. of July, and uh, you can come to Gen Con and uh, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so coming back to the two-player scope and how you utilize that to identify a split and how you're going to position yourself and how much you need to, it helps to first start with an idea of the best turn you can have. What's mm. your dream turn? Oh yeah. You start. You begin with the end in mind, and then you look at which cards you theoretically played in this dream turn, uh, en masse, and also which cards is which cards are just in your deck and don't harm it for being there. Uh, which cards can you not have too much of? in this strategy that you're looking at. Essentially, we're talking about non-terminals at this point, right? Good non-terminals. Yeah. Like, cantrips especially, but, uh, you know, non-terminals are great. Yeah, so we think about something like a highway, where, like, good you card. think about the best turn you could have, and it's playing a bunch of highways and then getting plus by, and the highways don't hurt you. You can draw from that conclusion that the highways are going to be split. And so you want to be looking for these patterns, starting with the best turn you could have, and then seeing which what card did you play the most of on that turn, understanding that that's probably the split that you're looking at. Yeah, so like you look at that in a little more detail, and you 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 know I was while he was telling me to imagine the best turn I could, I pictured myself grabbing the provinces, the the stack of provinces, not caring how many was in there, but grabbing them all because they're all mine, and then counting them later so I know how many duchies to get to, right? <laughs> so like. That was that's an amazing turn, right? Yeah. And you can do that with I would eight take that highways. Turn. Yeah, I would be okay with that turn. Yeah. I've done it twice in my life because, like, first of all, you have to have physical cards, and second of all, like, I mean, you have to be able to mega turn like that and yeah. have your opponents not rage quit on you. Sure. It feels amazing. Okay. Yeah, it's. It feels so good to grab. But anyway, he though. made some noises. There were a lot of really uncomfortable people in the room. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, like you can you can do that with eight highways in play, right? And sure, it's, uh, it's bridge trolls too, something like that. You can't really do that with only five highways. Yeah, right. And so if if that's a distinction, like if if I'm gonna need more than half of the pile to do that, then uh, 
chances are you're looking at something that's likely to be split. Right, and the other thing is that hopefully if your opponent is competent and they are going for something else... I mean, if they're going for the same thing, obviously you're going to fight over those highways. But if they're going for something else, um, they still hopefully understand that they need to try to keep you from getting those six or seven highways. Yeah, that's hard to do, by the way. That's really hard to do, and I find most of the time it's not practical unless they're contesting point cards, but that's maybe like 60-70% of the time. Sure. So don't don't take that as gospel. Just want to make sure we properly qualify that. Yeah, so that's going to be usually one of the best ways to identify what the split is going to be that you need to be gunning for. And the other thing that you want to be thinking about is as you're building, normally you just figure out what the best card for your deck is right now and you buy it. But as Adam alluded to before, sometimes when you're playing around a split, it's a little bit different. You, you might put a suboptimal card into your deck or at a suboptimal time simply because that pile is important and your position in it is precarious. Yeah, so, like, um, so I think it's useful to talk about what kind of effects that cards can give you that are that could potentially cause a split in order to get more of that effect? Yeah. So um, I think the most common one and probably the um, the the most powerful, I guess, is the village effect. So when I say something is a village, it just is a card that allows you to play more than one terminal action in a turn. That's what a village is. If your definition is different than mine, I recommend that you change your definition to mine. Or if it's working for you, I guess go ahead. But I think my definition is pretty great. Kind of like me. I'm pretty great. Yeah? Yeah. I'm humble, too. We're raffling off Adam's ego uh, next raffle. So uh, uh, you're going to have to with that. You're gonna have to get a U-Haul. Um, <laughs> you're going to have to get out of this house. Yeah. Um, up the moment. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, village effect. Uh, that's that's usually the common one, and so um, a lot of ways you can recognize that this is definitely going to be the case. Number one, there's only one stack of villages, right? It's yeah. Like, I mean, two villages. Um, probably not. Yeah, you're probably if there if there are ten villages to fight over, um, yeah. it, it's feasible that you might need to split those. If there are twenty yeah. villages to fight over, then. Not For a so moment, much. I thought you were like, if all ten kingdom cards were villages, yeah. like, yeah, you're probably going to have to fight over those. <laughs> yeah, I know you can't. <laughs> Who gets more villages? <laughs> you got to get to 55 villages or else you're going to lose. Yeah, no. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, like, there's there's one stack of villages. Usually it's going to be split. Well, okay, if there's more than one, it's probably not. Yeah. So, so there really should be one. And if there's one, and of course that's implying that, that, that you need villages for the best thing on that board, and the best thing on that board is playing a bunch of terminal actions. Yeah. And usually it is, because terminal actions tend to be really good, but... Sure. But that's um, why playing more than one of them in the same turn is, like, OP. Yeah, that's why we invented this term, to, like, classify all the cards that could do that, because yeah. it's so great. It yeah. feels amazing. So, like, I guess there's two types of terminal cards. A lot of times uh, it's terminal draw cards... Uh, or some draw card that needs village support in order to function. So, like, yeah, village think, and smithy, right? Yeah, we think about smithy or patrol or masquerade yeah, or something like, like that. There's, like, 30 of them, right? Yeah. So, uh, th if your draw is terminal, then um, if you have terminal payload as well, like, if you also want to play terminal cards that don't draw mm -hmm. after you've drawn a whole bunch of stuff... Um, you're going to want a lot of villages because you need villages to play your draw cards and then you need to play uh, your payload cards and you need villages for that too. And so um, not having enough villages is going to make your life a lot harder yeah. and they're probably going to be split. Right? Yeah, we, we talk about imagining that best turn that you could have earlier and if the best turn involves a bunch of the terminals then losing out on the village split uh, definitely puts a hard cap on how good your turns can be. Yeah, for sure, and and that that even holds if your draw is not terminal. Right. Like that's that's even more direct because the number of villages I have is the number of terminal payload cards I can play. Uh, well, minus one because you get the inaction sure. to start your turn. Yeah. But like that's that's directly limiting all the cool things yeah. you can do, and and so like you either need to get a lot of villages so you can do that enough. Or be okay with the idea that, well, I guess I'm only going to play like three or four terminal actions in my turn, and that's as good as it's going to get. 
Yeah, and so for those reasons, I would definitely agree that most commonly when we're talking about a split, A, we're talking about something non-terminal, that's the most common case, and B, village is probably the most commonly fought over effect. Right, I mean, this, kingdom there's, just, after kingdom. there's just so many situations that, that fall under what we've described here. Yeah. And so uh, village splits are typically important, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it only has to have, like, maybe one or two of these situations to have that happen to you. Yeah. So, so village is, is definitely the most common. Um, I, I suppose draw is also an effect. That yeah. Will, that will cause there to be a split, and you know, so like let's let's review the definition of draw I'm talking about because once again I think it's better than other definitions. But uh, when I'm talking about draw, I'm talking about a combination of cards that allows you to increase the number of cards you have in your hand without decreasing the number of actions. Right. So like we talked about the terminal draw, the draw that needs village support. Uh, you know, if if that's what's constraining you, then usually the villages are the critical component, and it is. Village yeah. split here. And so the canonical uh, example of what Adam's talking about would, of course, be lab, right? La well, lab, lab is the purest form of draw. Yeah. So lab and all of its cousins, like caravan or stables or something, all of those, uh, let's say that that's the draw. Um, I think that's going to be important in a lot of cases where your other deck control resources are limited. Sure. If, if thinning stuff to do. Yeah, if, if the thinning is really good, then you could probably, if it's really strong and you can thin your deck down away from the cards you don't want anyway, then you could, you're, you're less often going to see the draw be split. Like, you're less often going to see that be super critical. But if the thinning is weak and the draw is the limiting factor on how good that best turn you're imagining can be, yeah, absolutely. The person who gets sex labs is in a much better position than the person who gets four. Right. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm going to say that usually the village split is just in general more decisive sure. than a split on draw because a six to four village is, like... That can be that can be a, a significant jump in how effective your deck is. Yeah, six to four labs, especially when it matters, like when thinning is weak, um, and terminals are strong. Sure. In that case, I mean, yeah, sure, I would rather have the six labs. Labs are great, but um, I'm not as behind as I would be if I was, you know, down six villages to four. Sure. In that sure. particular case, uh, a couple of other types of draw that are relevant. Minion. Yeah. That's when you need a lot of, and winning the split on that is pretty decisive to how effective that deck is. Right, and you know, there's uh, and there's also governor. You can choose to draw cards with governor. You yeah. want a lot of governors. Governor split can be kind of a big deal. Sure. You'll notice that all of these cards are good, strong, non-terminal cards. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's draw. Yeah. Uh, there's I guess um, you can look at plus buy. But yeah, it's it's much less likely to be split over a card that gives you plus buy. Yeah, so p plus buy is generally not something that splits just by virtue of being plus buy because yeah. that would imply that you need to have six or seven buys in your turn, and your deck doesn't function if it doesn't. And that I I can't think of very many boards where that's true. Yeah, like it was easy for me to imagine like, oh, I can do this cool thing with ten villages, but I can't do it with five. Or I can do this cool thing with ten labs, and I can't do it with five. Yeah. But like, I I can do a cool thing with with ten buys, but I can't do it with five. Well, why don't I just do half the cool thing on two turns? <laughs> like I'm buying six cards. Like yeah, that sounds right. really good, and just doing that twice is. A lot of times it's going to be enough to win the game for you. So this yeah. definitely seems rarer, uh, and, but it's not impossible. Yeah, and I, I just want to, at the risk of belaboring the point and being repetitive, um, throughout all these examples of the different kinds of effects we've identified and how likely they are to be a split, I want to come back to how helpful it is to, at the beginning of the game, imagining what the best turn is. And so that help, that kind of guides your decision as to saying, okay, the draw is really important, or the village, I need that. Or... Some weird situation where I need ten buys. I need them, and then you, you can go for it accordingly. Yeah, this is this is something that I actually personally have had a lot of trouble with when I'm trying to teach people Dominion, and they ask me how to get good. And there's there's something that I do where I'm imagining those good turns, and I say I kind of say out loud like, 
well, I'm going to play a bunch of labs to draw a bunch of cards, I'm going to play a bunch of villages to have a bunch of actions, and then I'm going to play these cards, and it's going to be amazing. Yeah. But sometimes I have to describe a more involved process that seems more painful, and uh, usually that process is the process that's going to be the, the crunchy part of the deck, and if that crunchy part of the deck involves just gaining a buttload of cards, including the entire stack of villages and moats, so that I can get my hand size back up to seven after I got goons, and then I'll have one action left, like that, that seems really painful. Sure. You know? Yeah. So, so that's and usually the part of the, the board that's going to be split, right? I'm going to be focusing on villages there. Yeah, in that situation, definitely. Um, the other thing is that, of course, imagining that best turn is kind of something that comes much more naturally with experience. When you've yeah. seen a better player have that best turn, it's a little easier to become a better player by doing it yourself later. That's true. Uh, a lot of, I mean, I don't have much of an imagination. <laughs> And uh, if your imagines if your imagination's broke like mine, uh, it can be hard to imagine amazing turns like just like the sky is the limit, man. Can't aim too high. Bro. I play a horn of plenty and I gain a province off of it. Nice. Yeah. Nice turn. And then I gain back the horn of plenty. From yes. The patch. That's so good. I play. Okay. Whatever. That was, anyway. that was pretty sweet. So like yeah. a lot of these situations, you know, they they tend to happen a lot more with villages and draw them with plus by. That doesn't mean it's impossible to have a plus by split be relevant. Sure. Uh, I think the most common case is when you're kind of in the thick of it and you're being mirrored, and let's say you really want to have a large number of gains because you're dancing around a three-pile ending. Sure. I would say having more plus buy cards can give you more flexibility in that case to threaten more things. Yeah, and that's kind of the concept that we will hear gone into in quite a few, di not just here, but in various articles, posts, other podcasts and things where people will talk about the word pile control. And the, just this concept you have of being able to empty cards from the supply and that being key to your positioning on winning the game. Yeah, you could get into a plus buy split being important in that situation. Yeah, we touched on that in the end game play episode we did like yeah. 10 episodes ago. Yeah. So I'm thinking like um, Market Square, uh, like it needs to be non terminal, and sure. uh, Cantrip plus buy cards are. are pretty hard to come by and also like you don't want to get something super expensive it's so, like i don't see it happen that much with market like, right ma maybe workers village but that's a village so it's a lot more likely to be <laughs> yeah subject to a split for that reason and yeah you know, si similar on the same tangent and this kind of segues into um other kinds of payload that mm -hmm. are often split but grand market is an interesting one that gets split quite a bit and it's it's got plus buy on it and it's non-terminal um but, like, the plus buy is not why you're splitting it, which is the interesting part. That's true. Although, um, there, there are two cards that happen uh, the, the, when they come up in my life. I always just think of estate pile out, and grand market is one of them. Yeah. So, like, getting seven grand markets can be really good just so you can threaten an estate pile out. So I, I would say that aspect of it, the plus buy, could be relevant, although not necessarily so. Uh, the other card will be left as an exercise to the reader. <clears throat> Leave a comment in the comment section. Uh, Paula, let, let me know what you think. Anyway, yeah, get, let's get inside Adam's brain and, and think about what Adam's thinking of. It'll be fun. Yeah. No, why are you looking at me that way? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so... Anyway, so... <laughs> so, yeah, Market's pretty expensive. Um, Hamlet isn't exactly a cantrip. Uh... <laughs> If right. you're like swimming in that much draw, then like, so we're we're not on plus Hamlet. buy from yeah. Hamlet. Uh, the, I mean, it, it just seems a lot of things have to go right for that to be the plus buy yeah. split. I, I'm stretching pretty far here. Yeah, I've seen it matter for Bridge before, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, if you have all the other resources and and it's a mirror and all you want to do is play bridges, but like these are pretty rare. Plus buy is pretty rare. I think the other forms of the payload are also pretty rare, but they're pretty pretty—they're a little easier to talk about. Yeah. So you can look at Grand Market or Conspirator, and you're like, wow, draw's really limited here, and this is the best way for me to get payload that doesn't make me have to draw extra cards to do it. Yeah. And yeah, so definitely. I care about that split. It may not be quite as decisive as something yeah. like a Village split, but like my deck is definitely going to be better if I have six Grand Markets in it, and that's the case. Yeah, the expected value of your turns definitely goes up quite a bit over oh, your yeah. opponents if you have... 60% of the grand market pile. Mm -hmm. So 
the other ones uh, that you wanted to get into as well. Yeah, so highway is a big one. We talked about yeah. highway as the example. Yeah, it's if there's any plus buy on a kingdom at all, you can almost assume just based on that that there's going to be a highway split, and it's going to be very important. Uh, yeah, in a two-player game, that'll probably happen more often than not, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think Groundskeeper, I mean, you, you've you preached about Groundskeeper split <laughs> many times, and that's certainly something that the split matters, because, like, you're scoring yeah. a lot of points. And, I mean, this does relate to points, but points are really good. Well, and if you have decided that Groundskeeper is going to be your vehicle for winning the game, if the points that, in other words, the points that you're gaining from Groundskeeper are going to be how you win the game and that's your lead, then, yeah, you need more of them than your opponent. You need to be getting more per victory card you put into your deck. Yeah, if you want to draw in that deck is super tight. If you want to win the game, then win, Then winning the points split is pretty good. Yeah, that's and our John Madden. Good. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That's our John Madden commentary. If you want to win the game, you have to have more points than your opponent when it's over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, I mean, that's pretty insightful. Yeah. I think that's I think that's one of the better I, things we've ever said on this podcast. I could apply that to every game of Dominion. Wow. Well, okay, no, I couldn't, because there are times when you win on turns. <laughs> so, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> oh, man, edge cased. So uh, hard. Okay. Uh, so. so, yeah, I, I think Wild Hunt is kind of a, an exception here. Yeah. I mean, the idea is you want to play more Wild Hunts than your opponent, but having the ability to play... Assuming you have the ability to play all those wild hunts, yeah, uh, just having them in your deck can be the limiting factor. So I've seen that happen before. Yeah, so definitely um, the wild hunts. It doesn't even necessarily come down to playing more of them, but having more of them means that you have more freedom to play with that points pile. For sure. I mean, you definitely want to be able to threaten it, but like yeah. being able to really threaten it, or, or you know, yeah. Leave leave the pile with zero points on it and get a good haul for yourself. It's yeah. pretty decent. Occasionally, and this doesn't come up all the time. Uh, maybe it's about as rare as the plus buy split mattering. There's some kind of attack that um, needs that will be split by virtue of it being an attack. I think the most common example I'm thinking of is knights. Like a lot of the time, um, oh, if the yeah. knights if the knights are really strong, um, getting six of them can kind of put you in a really good position to shut down your opponent's deck. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Knight serves kind of as the defense to itself, so it creates yeah. that dynamic. Dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we've gone into recognizing that a split is going to be important, and we've even gone into sort of how to evaluate uh, whether or not you need to be worried about a split, but... You, not all splits are gone for sort of at the same time. Just because something's important doesn't mean you go for it as soon as you can and you get it every chance you get. The big example I'm thinking of is in a game that has Duke, um, the duchy <laughs> you split... shouldn't open duchy. Right. The duchy right. split is super important. <laughs> Letting your opponent buy all eight duchies probably means you just lose that game. <laughs> That doesn't mean you buy a duchy the first time you hit five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's the extreme example of what we're talking about here. So, like, but the idea that we've talked about, you build a little suboptimally sometimes just to play around a split, but there's a limit. And there are some questions you want to ask yourself when deciding uh, whether or not you're ready to start building. You need to start building suboptimally. Do you feel lucky? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, do first, you? First off, uh... <laughs> You want to get into what the thing is that the split is doing, and how good is the thing? Like, how, uh, in other words, how important is the split? Like, the yeah. best example I can think of is Worf, in that case. Sure. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I think village splits, uh, in general, can be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Worf is a very good card. And it's... And it is an example of this as well, yeah. And... Part of the reason that it's a good example of that question is because it's usually going to run out a lot of the time when it's uh, when you see a wharf board, the wharves are going to run out, and that split has a super variable impact on the game state. You know, you'll see a board sometimes where a person who gets six or seven wharves is just miles ahead, but then there are other boards where three wharves is plenty to do everything you want to do. So deciding how to evaluate that split comes down to how often you need to utilize that plus buy and the draw and things like that. So like with Wharf, a lot of the times when you want to buy it, it's already the best card for your deck. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess 
there are some cases where maybe you don't have the terminal space for it now. But, oh, there's only two left, and if I get them both, then I've got six and my opponent has four, or I've got seven and my opponent has three. Yeah, and if, if you're... A lot of the time you might buy it just because you're leaving them with three wharves forever. Yeah, like, denial in that case, like, especially with wharf, because you... I mean, they're going to have turns where they only have one wharf in play, and, and if that feels bad to think about, then maybe you should try and do that to your opponent. Yeah, is which segues into the next consideration that tells you when it's time to really importantly prioritize the split, and that's evaluating how much are you already winning or losing that split by. <laughs> um, we got into this with the wharves, but let's talk about ports, too. Just as an example, we're coming back to the village split. Uh, maybe you're building this deck, and you've decided that two ports lets you do everything you want to do on your turn, um, and that's all you need. You don't need them yet, but suddenly your opponent has eight of them. <laughs> now it's time to get the ports, because you're losing by a lot. Similarly, if you're on the other side of that equation, and you see that a pile is kind of running low, and your opponent doesn't have enough of the thing they need, even if you have enough of it, maybe you just take the opportunity to deny it to them. Right, and you can even threaten to deny it. So leave the pile in a place where if they don't get it, if they don't empty it on their next turn, they're in big trouble. Sure. So, like, first of all, you, you might force them to buy the card when they didn't want to because of the split. Yeah, which or, is a win in and of itself. Yeah, or maybe they don't have that turn and they can't get it, and now there's this permanent effect because they, they didn't wake up on that turn with a good enough hand yeah. to take care of it. And so if you can, like, a lot of times the threat of this is worse than the execution yeah. of it because sometimes they just buy it and it's over and it's like, oh, well. But, you know, if you can put pressure on that pile, you don't even have to empty the pile, but just think about what's it going to be like if I if they don't get these and it, you can force them into the situation where they have to, to buy those cards and, and sure. it's not good. Like, at the end of the day, you're causing them to put a card in their deck that's not the best card for it. Yeah. And if you can make them do that, it's bad for them. Yeah. It's almost like an attack. Yeah. That point, yeah. yeah um, the, the split attack. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing that you think about is uh, when you're deciding that whether or not to go for a split right now is what does the card do for or to your deck? Uh, we alluded to this with the duchies earlier. Like, even if the duchy split is decisive for the game... A lot of the time, putting a duchy into your deck is so disruptive that right now you just aren't going to do it, even though you've decided it's how you win. That's kind of the difference between when duchy is important versus when distant lands is important. Because the distant lands isn't doing horrible things to your deck, so you can buy it a little earlier. Yeah, I think that's the, the most extreme example. And a lot of the point-related examples are like that. Yeah. If you, if you want to force your opponent to green earlier than they want, then, you know, that sucks for them. Yeah, no and fun. similarly, we get into something like an encampment plunder split or a minion split. A lot of the times you go for those immediately when they're good because they are creating value for your deck pretty much at every phase of the game. So there's just no... They, they do good things, so there's no reason not to get it. And if the split's important, all the better. Yeah, Plunder is such a good card for almost any deck that, like, yeah. if I can buy a Plunder for five and I have five, like, I'm going to do that. If I can buy a Plunder for, like, eight and I have eight, a lot of time I'm doing that. Over I would buy Plunder here. if it cost eight. Yeah, I would. Actually, if Plunder were just a supply pile and it costs eight, I probably would buy it, yeah. That's what I just said. That is what he said. Yeah. Maybe I do just repeat what Adam says. <laughs> do I do that? Oh my god. I yeah, totally just do that. You use, you use different words, though. It's fine. Yeah, no, I know. I phrase it uh, alteringly. Yeah, so. The podcast needs someone to laugh at all my jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> wait, wait, no, 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 no. Hold on, no, no. You're the funny guy. You make uh, the jokes and I laugh at the jokes. Okay. I'm the smart guy and you're the funny guy, right? I thought I was the handsome guy. Oh, come on. We're both the handsome guy. Can they see us? They no. can now. No. Yeah. No. Are you going to put that picture up of you, like, angry eating at the festival? <laughs> um, I wasn't angry eating. That was delicious. You look, how can you look you be, angry. How can you be angry eating that delicious funnel cake? Uh, you found a way. <laughs> so, like, we get into uh, timing a split, and you, you think about some cards that have a split 
uh, that is more important later in the game than it is earlier. Like the card City, for instance. You did an episode on City. Yeah. Uh, with Wandering Winter way back when, right? Yeah, it's been a minute, but like, uh, City's a weird card. Yeah. So like, uh, we could we could do a whole episode on it. <laughs> you did do a whole episode on it. Yeah. So uh, go listen to that if you're curious. Yeah, but and I bring it up here because it's a good example of when timing going for a split is important because. You know, the cities are great once that pile runs out, and once it does run out, the split is super important, but just buying a city every time you hit five is a super inefficient thing to do, mm. unless you have some other pile control to threaten and make that pay off earlier. Right, like, there's there's just not a compelling reason for you to put a card in your deck that's not the best card for your deck right now. Yeah. And, and like... Maybe this will be better in eight turns is, is not a compelling enough reason. Yeah. You you need something more. And I, I bring this up because I think it also applies to a card that came out much more recently called Chariot Race. And a lot of the time, uh, the Chariot Race is something that gets split in a lot of games. Like, it's not something you usually want to let your opponent get all of, but, like, you can punish them pretty hard for going for that split, and I'm putting that in quotation marks, just by thinning your deck and shutting down their payload. So, like, that kind of gets into a split that's important later in the game, but it also kind of gets into what we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, which is identifying when something isn't a split. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking just about... it's going to run out. But, so, like, winning chariot races is not really a thing that happens ever <laughs> anyway. So, like... That's Adam. <laughs> I've never seen it happen, okay? Yeah. I've never seen, like, I, I put it in my tournament sets, and I watch, and I see people play Chariot Race, and then they're like, aww. I've never Darn. seen them play, yeah, they're like, fudge bars. But I've yeah. never seen them play a Chariot Race and be like, oh, yippee skippy, I, I get got a dollar point. <laughs> point. I'm so good at Dominion. That doesn't happen. So, and that, that don't, Chariot's, whatever, I'm done. Well, I bring up Chariot Race, too, just because I think it's a really good example of identifying when something looks like a split just because it's non-terminal and it's a good pile that's going to run out, but it's not actually a split because who, who gets more Chariot Races rarely actually determines the, the uh, potency of the Chariot Races. When a card has a context-dependent impact like that, you're usually better served by tuning your deck to maximize its potential rather than focusing on the split. It's like the um, the idea that if you want to play the copies of that card that you have in your deck more often before you buy more copies of the card, a lot of times that's a better way to do it. Sure. Now, if you want to play all of them every turn, then sure, the split is more likely to matter. Yeah. But But I'm also like... You, you're talking about when you get this thing. Like, I'm not going to open with a chariot race. Cause no, that's usually a mistake, I think. Yeah, you don't you don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think... I, I mean, normally you want to put the best card for your deck in your deck. And on turn one and turn two, I'm pretty much never thinking about a split in terms of putting the best card in my deck right yeah. now. Yeah. So it depends on, like, what it is, too. So, like, if you decide, like, Fool's Gold... It's like a super yeah. important spot. So you like, might turn one or two. I searched, them. I searched through the entirety of Dominion, and I found like two examples of when I would think about a split in the opening like this. Fool's Gold was one of them, mm -hmm. and the other one was uh, the Hermit Market Square deck. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, uh, an amazingly broken thing to watch happen. Right. We actually have an episode on that, too. <laughs> but, like, there's, there's a very specific build because it's a combo deck, and combo decks do that. So, like, th this is super narrow, and it's super rare, and, like, most of the time, you really just want to put the best card for your deck in your deck. And, and so, like, before the game starts, you know, it can be difficult to figure out what a split is because it kind of does depend on your opponent. If your opponent's not going to contest you on it, then, okay, well, I guess it's not a split this time, LOL. So right. you know, maybe wait a few turns while you're making your deck better and then yeah. look at what your opponent's doing and then evaluate, like, oh, how much does my opponent seem to care about this? Yeah. Do they care about it so much that they're willing to put a bad card in their deck? And then what does that do for me? And maybe do I need to respond? And, and then you go into the rest of what we've talked about. Like, you think yeah. about how bad is it going to be if I don't get enough of this? Or, yeah. Or, like, what's how bad is it going to be if I put this card in my deck that it isn't the best right now? Right. And, of course, that is 
really important in terms of always reading the game state and uh, playing your buys accordingly, not playing like a bot, basically. But it's also the reason that we led with the advice that you assume your opponent isn't going to make a mistake. You assume, right. you assume that if the... You start out, anyway, at least assuming that if something... That if a split would be important, if it's a really good strategy, that your opponent's going to contest you on it. And then if they give you information that they're not doing that... Then you proceed. Sure. But yeah. yeah. So I, I want to point out a, a fact, though. Like, a lot of what we've been saying is sort of under the context of it's the start of the game. But but now that I'm thinking, like, okay, I'm in a game and I'm identifying a split with this additional information I have, uh, chances are, if if I'm caring about that right now, pile's low, right? And yeah. If the pile's low, chances are I already have some of that card in my deck. One would assume. Which, which means at some point it was the best card to put in my deck. Yeah, well, at least one would hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> so, so like, you kind of know what it feels like, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you do have a little bit more information uh, what to go by in terms of, like, well, I mean, my deck would be really better if I had more of these, or my deck is doing what I want if I have enough of these. So so that's one metric you can think about. Uh, the, the other thing is, now that you're in this situation, let's say I have, uh, you know, there's maybe five or six of these these split pile cards left. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll use minion as an example. So, like, clearly we both are going for minions, and, like, minion could perhaps be the best card for your deck at this point, because, yeah. you know, you, that tends to be the case with minion. So now I have six, and altar's on the board. Well, altar gains minions! Blah! This is yeah, great, right? Definitely. That definitely is a really good point because we've gone into a lot of how and why you play to a split, or when and why you play to a split, but we can definitely get into the execution and the how you position yourself to win a split once you've decided it is important. Sure, and so like you can start the game thinking about how you're gaining a lot of these cards, but now I'm in a situation, I could buy the altar or I could buy the minion. If there's one minion left in the pile, Maybe I need to get the minion. Yeah. <laughs> if there's enough minions in the pile where that altar is going to, quote, pay for itself by getting me an extra minion because I played the altar, right. then, you know, I need to consider the altar and, and I need to think about, okay, well, if it's just going to get me the one and pay for itself, do I want an altar in my deck in that point? And if the answer is yes, sure, get it. And if the answer is no, then don't. And if it's going to gain me multiple minions, like on turn yeah. three I hit a lucky six, then I'm going to get that altar. I'm going to be very happy with it. Yeah, so getting a card that'll help you gain more cards of it doesn't just apply to, uh, like, Altar that can gain Fivers. Like, if you decide that a lesser cost thing is important, then obviously something like a Workshop or Ironworks kind of fills the same role. And maybe we're even getting into plus buy territory, like something like Margrave could be looked at as an investment in winning a split, just because it's going to help you get more of the thing later. Provided you can draw it and use it to gain an extra copy before that pile runs out. So, a lot of times when it's worth it to go for these splits, like a village split, when, when you want to build a deck that makes use of villages, a lot of times it is because there's some way to gain or buy multiple cards in a turn. There's sure. enough payload to justify that extra building, right? Yeah. So, um, yes, you want to get these cards earlier because uh, I remember when we talked about openings. Yeah. Opening with gainers is great because... Uh, you can get lots of copies of these cards. It's a great way to, to shove more good cards in your deck in a faster way. So getting gainers early is a way to do that. Definitely. And so the, the same principle applies here. Even if it's not the opening, that's still a priority in the early part of the game. And we get into, as well, the, util the, the execution of winning a split. And one of the really important things you want to ask yourself is how much does that thing cost? Like, how expensive is the card that you think is going to be split? So, if it costs less than five, then you understand that your deck has already started with the capability to produce hands that consistently gain copies of it, right? Hmm. Um, so, you don't necessarily need to start investing an extra payload to win the split. You can just start buying the card. But if sure, if, the, if there's no workshop, then sure. I mean, if $4 yeah. card's important, I'm going to start buying it. Maybe I'll open with it. I've yes. opened Conspirator before, and it's been amazing. Yeah. Like, sometimes you do that. The math changes, of course, when the card costs 5 or 6 that you want to split. Like, mm. you know, Minion or something. A lot of the time, you, even if... 
like you will definitely build into a little extra payload so that this deck that you have that isn't really capable of gaining cards of that price consistently can actually start making those hands. Yeah, that's, I mean, that comes up a lot with the type of cards like Minion that by themselves, like you buy the first time and now that helps you hit five some more. Uh, yeah. Sometimes that's the case. I guess for Dutchy, it's the other extreme example <laughs> where it, it hurts you. So yeah, they're, they're all over the place on the spectrum, but. Sure, but uh, the, thing. The, if you've decided that a that a card is important and it's going to be split, in addition to capacity to gain multiple of it, also just think about how much it costs and what kind of deck you need to build right now to start gaining and, and contesting that split. Yeah, like prioritizing the split isn't always necessarily, I'm going to buy a copy of this card and then I'm going to gain a copy of this card because I bought a copy of this card. It's like, I want to do this a lot, Yes. Yeah. so let me... Let me hit five, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so there is one other aspect of splits that I think we should cover because it in, we saved it for last because it kind of ties into everything that we talked about it before, and that's how split piles, like literal split piles, there are five of one and five of another in this pile, um, kind of basically play on everything we've talked about in a more extreme way. Yeah, it like turns it up to 11. Yeah, well, I guess up to ten because there's ten cards in the pile. Yeah, the most extreme one I think we can all agree is Sauna Avanto. Mm. Yeah, that winning. feels so good. Yeah, <laughs> like getting three or two Saunas slash Avantos, depending on what else is going on in the kingdom, can be kind of game decisive. And like you playing around that split uh, is definitely something you think about all of the concepts that we've mentioned. Like. Mm. Do I, obviously, like, I probably am going to buy a sauna in the beginning, unless there's something that's going to help me gain saunas throughout. Unless there's, like, a good way of trashing cards that isn't crap. <laughs> yeah. Can I say that? Uh, okay. You can bleep it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and by the time those run out, you think about, like, oh, do I have enough in my deck to hit Avanto consistently, and things like that. And if not, you build into it. If not, then you cry because that means you never collided Sauna and Silver and your opponent probably did. Yeah, you're probably losing that game, but you can still pretend that it matters. Yeah. <laughs> you can still do that. Yeah. There's hope for you, little guy. Yeah. Big guy? Uh, medium guy. Medium guy. Yeah, there we go. Nice! <laughs> we <Yeah>. did it. <laughs> We are all-inclusive so, so on this good. podcast. That was really good, yeah. Making luck. An all-inclusive podcast. A, a medium guy podcast. A mediocre podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, do you have anything else to say about split piles or splits or doing the splits? Uh, well, I do have some things to say about doing the splits. Make sure you're uh, wearing the right pants for it. That's, that's really... Stretch first, too. It depends on how you get into the splits. Okay. If you're one of those people that like is standing and then you let your legs go out from under you and then you just like bounce into the splits. Yeah. Like yeah, you're gonna wanna stretch before that. Yeah, I mean that's really impressive if you can do that. It's like shocking. Um Yeah. I might ask. I like, can't hey, imagine it being comfortable. That's amazing. Why did you do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And then and then you're gonna be like can you help me out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that may so. not have been the best impression, but I don't really give a crap. Anyway, uh, so we have a kingdom. Yeah, we do. And so uh, <laughs> we, it was actually, so it was funny. Adam and I rolled like 17 kingdoms coming up with yeah, one like because 55 kingdoms. it was kind of tricky to come up with a kingdom to talk about the concept of splits, right? Like you could almost talk about anything. So we, we had a few culprits that uh, we thought would make for good split discussion in this kingdom all right so uh the, <laughs> here we got some cards uh we yep. have apothecary encampment grand market masquerade night watchman necromancer highway trading post farmland goons and there's seaway and wall once again for our audio only listeners and i'll, I'll even do this one in cost order <laughs> apothecary Nope. Encampment. You already failed. Apothecary, Encampment, <laughs> Masquerade, Night Watchman, Necromancer, Highway, Trading Post, Farmland, Goons, Grand Market, and there's Seaway and Wall. Yeah, so this is... 
actually a kingdom I'm pretty excited to dig into because I have a few questions about it and I don't know what the answers are, but I'm sure I'll find out. There's like a bunch of crap happening here. There's yeah. like so much stuff. So like the highway split is something that like you almost always care about in every context because highways if there's plus by. Yeah, if there's plus by. And there is. And there is. Uh, highway seaway is like broken. Yeah, highway seaway is amazing. Like if you can seaway the highways, which you can if you play a highway and then hit five. The so like you have to build to do that though. So like if you decide that's the way that you're gonna win the game, what's the quickest way to do it? Uh, you just get thin and you put seaway on highway. Now that deck, of course, has spent all its time doing that, so it gets hurt pretty hard by the discard attack from goons. Sure, but if you get thin enough, you probably don't care. Yeah, maybe not, but then if you get too thin, there's masquerade threat. <laughs> you can use masquerade to get thin, man! <laughs> it's so good! Yeah, so like, there are some really powerful, potentially, things to do here, and a lot of them are kind of competing with each other. I think. Uh, yeah, so, like, and you just can't let your opponent have eight highways. If no. you do that, they win the game, no matter what, pretty much. So, like, you have to get highways. I think and... you need at least four. Um, if your opponent has decided to right. go for highways, I think you need to have at least four of them. Yeah, so, like, highway split, we did it, guys. Yeah. We did it. It's I'm, a split. I'm proud of us. So, like, the, the other thing is, like, there's goons, which is a rough discard attack, and the only, like, there's there's not that much real draw here. Masquerade is draw that requires village support, only villages encampment, which is draw, so, like, I guess all your draw kind of depends on encampment. Yeah, so, like, the, the question, I mean, like, normally you wouldn't pick up an early gold here, I don't think, but... It feels bad, man. If you have built a deck that is revolving around that draw, then, like, you... Oh, my God. Picking up gold over goons. Feels pretty bad. Uh, I'm not but... really sure that I would do that all that much. Yeah, so... I'm not, I'm not really convinced that, like, the goons is really that good? So Did I just say that? The goons? You don't think the goons is that good? I think that if you have a deck that already has the gold and the encampment, I think the goons is amazing. Okay, but that that sounds like a pain. Like yeah, it's. <laughs> I just kind of want to get a masquerade and thin and get highways and like seaway them and maybe get some grand markets. Yeah. So the risk there is that you have if your opponent adequately contests that split and you don't get to the point where highways just win you the game, then whatever else they've been building could have, could be a little higher payload than what you've built. Maybe, but like I don't. I just don't think that. I don't think that can really happen. I think Highway yeah. Seaway is too good by itself. I'm saying, like, Goons is not even all that great here. Go well, ahead. Disagree. I think that Goons is super good if you set up the position that I'm describing where you've already got the encampment and the gold. And if you do that quickly enough to, make it, to hit your opponent with discard attacks while it matters, I think the Goons could counter the Highway strategy pretty decently of course All right, good luck with that you could fail to get there quickly enough right so in that case it kind of just comes down to draws and optimization uh i think more often than not you'll fail maybe bring it. i can't wait to more often than not fail bring it so uh, the other question is like no matter what strategy you decide to go for i don't necessarily know that your opener is all that different well, Masquerade's a really good card. On a 5-2, yeah. I'm probably going to be happy and open with a trading post. And then sure. get an encampment, because why not? Yeah. And on a 4-3, uh, well, I want to get a Masquerade. And then I'm going to be I'm gonna be conflicted between like getting a silver with it or picking up a 90. Yeah, so I'm looking at probably either masquerade night watchman to determine a turn three masquerade to uh, guarantee a turn three masquerade or i might be looking at necromancer night watchman for the same reason i necromancer the yeah i mean the idea being that it could be kind of a long-term investment especially uh, if i decide not to go for highways I, 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 I think that's really bad i think opening with masquerade is something you have to do I don't think Necromancer's good to open with at all. 
I I mean, so like ne Masquerade is what I said first, so it's the strongest consideration of mine. I'm not willing to rule out Necromancer just yet. I'm, I'm willing, willing to give to it some it thought. I'm willing to rule it out. I think it's way worse than Masquerade. All right, I'm gonna stroke my chin about this a little bit. All right, stroke away, man. Stroke. We got a week. <laughs> Hashtag stroke away. We got a week and maybe like an extra bonus twelve hours because the next episode might be uploading overnight instead of uploading at night. We'll see. Yeah. So like, I would almost. I was about to ask if you think Apothecary is okay here, but I think the answer is definitely not because I'm not into uh, it. Wall. Like I was gonna say that like you're punished a little bit for over thinning because of Masquerade, but like you're punished harder for not doing it because of Wall. So. Yeah. Oh. Um, Apothecary, I think you ignore. Huh. I want to try the Potion Masquerade opening. It doesn't seem good, but I want to try it. Seems bad, but I want to try it. Well, I mean, that's what this uh, week to play One Kingdom is about. We're going to try everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you press me right now, if I get to play this game once, I think I'm going to open Masquerade Silver. Really? Not Night Watchmen? Yeah. I'm going Masquerade Night Watchmen all day. All day, huh? Yeah. I want that turn three Masquerade. If I'm buying the Masquerade, I want it turn three. And I don't want to have to worry about whether I'm going to get it. Turn three or turn four is fine. I don't want it turn five. I want to hit five twice. That's not possible. I want to hit five. I don't know. I think it's it's fine. Yeah. I think I like Plus, the silver. Like eventually, once our decks are good, I have this Night Watchman in my deck that had a really high impact at the beginning of the game, and then it's trash. I can pass you later because <laughs> I don't want it anymore. Good for you, man. You must be proud. Yeah, I am. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. We'll we'll see if a goons list strat can make it happen here. Yeah, totally. Uh, let us know what you would do on this kingdom uh, in the comments, and as always, enter the raffle to win your. Uh, did I say ten or fifteen dollars? Fifteen. There's a Chipotle gift card. I don't know. I'll figure it out. I really hope I win this because I love Chipotle. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm not winning this, am I? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's very diplomatic of you. I appreciate yeah. it. You got it, man. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, hit uh, hit us up on the forums or in the comments or whatever, and uh, you know, come back next time. Yeah. Talk more about. You should breathe really heavily into it. <laughs> yep, <it's> just... <laughs> it sounds like this all the time, you just haven't heard it because of the crappy audio quality. Was that our intro?